Culture is a provocative word. And one of the reasons for that is because of social engineering. So in the context of social engineering, uh, culture is a bad word. And I don't want us to understand it that way. In my view, the creation of an American Islamic culture or of a British Islamic culture does not mean that we force everybody to be the same. It doesn't mean that we all eat the same, that we all dress the same, that we all wear beards or don't wear beards. What it means is that we have a basic matrix of values that are a matter of consensus. Those values would be Islamic values, core Islamic values, such that all Muslims have consensus on them. And then there would be other values that pertain specifically to the society in which we live. Exactly what that will be, exactly how it will manifest itself, uh, that I don't know. And I don't care to know, really. I'd love to see. And I would emphasize that from my perspective, most of the aspects of culture that we need to create don't need fatwas because many of them fall in that area of Islamic law that is neutral. In addition to the fact that in Islamic law there are five maxims which are a matter of consensus among all the schools. <clears throat> Those maxims are that things are judged, matters are judged, according to their purpose. The next one is that certainty is never removed by doubt. The third is that harm will be removed. The fourth is that difficulty brings alleviation. And the fifth is that custom, meaning sound custom, good custom, rules. Al-Ada muhakkama, that good custom arbitrates. And this is one of the basic qualities of Islamic law throughout the ages, that wherever Muslims go and find something good in the local culture, they adopt it. They may modify it, they may beautify it, but this is the pattern. And that's why one of the amazing things about Islamic culture is that it manifested itself as a peacock's tail that went from east to west, that was filled with all kinds of different colors, all kinds of different ethnic groups, cultural backgrounds, languages, yet it was a single tail. It was Islamic. It was united in the basic principles of the law. It was united in the basic principles of the theology. So how do the Chinese, for example, speak about Islam in China? Um, you have big problems in Chinese that come from the use of ideograms, you know, the symbolic letters, you also have problems that come from the difficulty for Chinese, given the tonal nature of their language, to pronounce the sounds of foreign languages. So if you wanted to say, for example, Islam, it would come out Yisilam. Yisilam. And if you wanted to say the religion of Islam, it would be Yisilam Jiao, which sounds strange and which is foreign. That's a fault in Chinese culture. So what the Chinese did, also you have to spell it. And if you try to spell Yisilan, it means that you have to use ideograms that basically give those sounds, but they may be comical. They may create an impression that is not appropriate. The Chinese Muslims, therefore, called their religion Qingzhen Jiao 
which means the religion of the pure and the real. This was a brilliant uh, tour de force because it appropriated the symbols of the sacred from the most ancient and revered traditions of China. And it made them the identity of Chinese Muslims. So therefore, it made Islam something interesting to the Chinese. Qing Zhen were symbols of profound meaning. They meant that the religion was pure, that it was pure on the inside and the outside, that it was sincere, also that it was a religion that was predicated on the ultimate realities of heaven and earth. And that's what Islam is. When you go into a mosque in China, you often see four ideograms which say the primordial religion from the foundation of heaven. This was the approach that the Chinese Muslims took to everything that they did.